Hi, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Mort Chatterjee. I'm one half of Chatterjee and Lal. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, to the gallery uh, this afternoon for uh, this uh, walkthrough. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. Um, waters are over in the corner of the gallery if anyone feels thirsty. Um, so let me introduce you to the program today. You are in our current exhibition, uh, which is the Unpaved, Crusty, Earthy Road, Nelly Setna a Retrospective. It's part of a constellation of exhibitions under the umbrella of Simrosa at 50, celebrating 50 years of Simrosa Art Gallery. And uh, tonight is part of a series of events that we have planned over the next uh, month, month and a half. Uh, and while I have you all captive, I'll tell you that the next event will be on the 15th at 5.30 at Simrosa Art Gallery, when Ranjit Hoskote will be conducting a walkthrough of the exhibition at Simrosa called the Simrosa Chronicles. Tonight, however, we are very fortunate to have Nancy Adajania with us. Um, the curator of this exhibition, and to introduce her, I would like to invite Dr. Feroza Godrej to introduce her and to welcome you. So, Feroza, if I may. Thank you so much, Mort, and thank you everyone here who's come for this really, really important and landmark event. I'm sorry we're all masked, but we have to observe COVID protocol, and uh, I appreciate all of you having your masks on. Today, Nancy is going to take us around, and she's selected a very apt title, A Court of Nellies. Nellie and her husband, Homi, were really earthy, and they were indeed very custy crusty customers. So I couldn't have thought of a better title to this exhibition, Nancy. Nancy has been in the field of art for numerous years. And she has devoted herself to practicing what she calls, in two short words, culture and theory so very, very important for us in this field to keep as lodestones in our memory. Nancy, you inspire not only me, of course, you inspire Ranjit Hoskote. You alternate between the two muses of Ranjit and Nancy. And I am privileged to count them amongst my friends. Besides painting, art, sculpture, theory, Nancy in this exhibition has really thrown herself into the weaving of Nelly Setna. It's not a medium that we see very often. And Nancy will go into more detail about that. But I, for one, have been very passionate about this medium, as indeed other lesser known mediums like printmaking, drawing, ceramics, and photography, all of which you will hopefully see or have already seen in the other two exhibitions. It was a dream, more for Nancy. For me, it was a daydream, but for Nancy, it was a dream that after 2013, when Ranjit and Nancy curated a very unusual exhibition called No Pasi is an Island, and we were seeing where the progression of art went after the establishment of the JJ School of Art by the first baronet, Sir Jamshedji Jiji Boy. It was supposed to be a school which taught you craft and industry for the sake of industry from our Western region. 
And Nancy may go into that a little bit because Nelly is an alum of the Sir J.J. School of Art. And we just started counting over lunch one day. I said, how will we make this work? Are there that many Parsi artists? And believe you me, we quickly, between the three of us, rattled off more than 18, including filmmakers and tapestry weavers. We didn't have all the tapestries up on display as we had to be very selective due to constraints of space. But obviously, this thought has been ticking away in Nancy's mind. So she said, we're going to do this for Simrosa at 50. Take this one iconic medium with one iconic artist. And when we mentioned it to our host, Mortimer, before we could say where we will display this exhibition, he said, I'm going to do the show at Chatterjee and Lal. There was no choice. <laughs> And we said, of course, you do it at Chatterjee and Lal. So thank you, Mort. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Ranjit, for starting all this with no Parsi is an island. <laughs> it's from a Dunn poem. Not D-O-N-E. For those of you who are not well versed with literature, but John Donne, the famous poet. So thank you so much. I shall stop now. I have a, don't wish to stand between this wonderful treat. And uh, the text is marvelous. Please take your time and read it. In all three venues, the curators have done absolute justice to the text. It's not just the visual, but it's also the matter over here. And here you actually see Nelly from the beginning of her career right up to her last days in the photographs that we have here from various institutions and well-known photographers in the city of Mumbai. So thank you. My deep gratitude. It's a beautiful show, even if I have to say it. And I'm so glad to see almost all the tapestries up here. And I'm so glad to see some loans as well from collectors. One last word. Nelly had a good clientele. But people didn't look after this beautiful jewel of weaving. I keep on saying it. If you have a work of art, take care of it like you would a beautiful sari an heirloom, or a piece of jewelry. Yes, things do break. They do fray. But take care of it. I have had four or five phone calls after this invitation went out for the talk. I have one. I'm going to start looking for it. I had one. I think it's lost. So yes, Nelly continues to live on in our hearts and minds. And uh, as I said, they were both earthy, down-to-earth people. No nonsense and challengingly crusty. So, thank you very, very much, Nancy. And do enjoy this walkthrough. And as Maud said, join us on the 15th at 5 30 at uh, Simrosa at 72 Bulla by Desa Road. It's really a walk down memory lane. I have my former colleague and worker at the gallery, Usha Gaude. She said, I cannot believe what I saw this afternoon. It's true. Even I can't believe it sometimes. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing these 50 glorious years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Feroza, for this really very, very kind introduction. And the tapestries that we see around us today belong to the Jamshid and Firoza Godrich collection. Had, had Firoza not collected these wall hangings, we would never have been able to make this exhibition in the first place. So thank you, Firoza, for your continuous support to all my exhibition uh, projects. Uh, another thing that I'd like to say about Firoza is that Firoza's vision has always been cosmopolitan and inclusive. 
even when we gathered around the table, Ranjit, Feroza, and, and me, when we, when we decided to initiate No Parsis in Ireland, uh, which was in 2013 at the NGMA Bombay, uh, I remember telling Feroza that I was uncomfortable with uh, co-curating a show on Parsi artists. And um, it, whether it was possible to expand the brief of ethnography and, and, and bring in other facets of art, artistic practice. And that's when we thought about the notion of art as an expanded practice. And by expanded practice, we meant artists like Meli Gobai, for instance, uh, who was making children's illustrations in the 1960s in New York, or Nelly Setna, who was not only a fiber artist, but was also a crafts activist, or um, Shavak Chauda, who was uh, also who, who was very interested in dance, and he made illustrations on Bharatnatyam and Mohiniyattam for uh, Mulk Rajanan's Marg magazine. So, and, and, and Feroza was very, very happy to, to be part of a project that dealt with these expanded practices because her own vision also was something which included uh, practices such as ceramics, textiles, photography, sculpture, and printmaking. In fact, printmaking in, in the early 70s was seen as a stepsister of painting. And yet, Feroza was part of this path-breaking initiative, Zal Praxis. Uh, with Ajay Lakhanpal and uh, Akbar Padamsi. And um, uh, often uh, we see uh, the display of uh, the two portfolios of Zal Praxis with some very important names in it. And um, I, I have, I'm sorry, but I need to thank uh, quite a few people before I begin with the Nelly Setna retrospective. I need to thank uh, Mortimer and Tara, of course. Uh, without them, we would not again have had this beautiful, hospitable space for the display of Nelly's works. I also need to th thank Mort because he has been both the catalyst and the conveyor, convener, forgive me, and the conveyor, the convener and the catalyst of our collegium. And he has kept all of us together and in check, if I may say so, <laughs> when we were being unruly and uh, uh, sort of, you know, we were, we were just being impossible with, 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 uh, with trying to do things which perhaps um, were not pragmatic enough. So thank you, Mort, for that. And um, uh, I'd now like to um, talk about the Nelly Setna retrospective. Uh, we've al already had Feroza speak a little bit about Nelly and Homi Setna. The Setnas were people that I saw during my college days. Uh, Homi would always be on his scooter, and Nelly would be safely ensconced in the sidecar. And that's how we saw them uh, when we went for our lectures and film screenings at NCPA. This was during our college days, of course, and I wish I had spoken to Nelly about her practice, but you know, some meetings just don't uh, you know, happen. But, but perhaps the meeting that didn't happen then turned into an obsession for me after her passing away. Um, the Nelly Setna retrospective, as Feroza already said, the unpaved trusty earthy road, it's a quote that I found in a brief memoir by Nelly Setna. She did not write much, she uh, was a researcher and an activist, but uh, she, was not, uh, she was not very articulate in terms of her practice. She gave some interesting quotes uh, to journalists about her practice, but she did not write long essays uh, or uh, necessarily articulate her perspective. And, um, but in this little brief memoir, she talks about how uh, the early years of, of her growing up, uh, she had uh, an informal education and she spent all her time plucking and sniffing and observing plants, trees, creepers, moss. Uh, in this brilliant archival uh, video that you have, where you have an interview between Nelly Setna and Roshan Kalapesi, who was the founder of, the, of Paramparik Karigar, she talks about also the glittering uh, skin that is sloughed off by a snake. So these were her memories. And she always said that design is inherent in nature. Even your color palette, you can find your colors in nature. But as you see around, uh, around you, these uh, lovely, uh, gorgeous wall hangings, it was nature, of course. You have this fertile green, aquamarine, earthy tones. But I would also say, when you look at the evidentiary material here, you also see that she was inspired by the sacred and erotic geometry of the tantric tradition 
And this is something that, of course, has not been said about her work, but I'd like to put this on the table. Um, the reason why I say this is because I can see it in her work. You can see the, the, the symb symbology of yantra and yoni. Uh, the yantra, the sacred diagram, and yoni, the vulva, from the tantric tradition. And uh, whether it's in Sue's tapestry from 1974, or in this particular uh, triple garlanded green uh, wall hanging with these black threads uh, cascading down. And um, when you look at this green work, for instance, uh, you might think that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it reminds you of an elephant's caparison. Um, so you think of sacred festivity, you think of recession. You also have the work here, the magenta work with these arrowheads, which again is an optical illusion. And it would uh, remind you of a festival banner. So the, these associations with the utsav, with ritual, with propitia propitiation and procession are things that I actually found while, while looking uh, intensely at her wall hangings. And again, the idea was, I'd just like to say a little bit about the exhibition design. So when we were talking about, um, you know, I mean, how, how to lay out the, uh, these wall hangings, um, I decided from the very beginning that I wanted to create a field of wall hangings. And I wanted the viewer to walk through this maze of wall hangings. And they would see these as sculptures in the round. Even when a wall hanging has faded because of age, what you see behind the wall hanging is the palette that she used. So again, the cerulean, the blues, the greens, you can actually see them behind these wall hangings. I did not just want them to be stuck to the wall. Um, and another thing that I was also doing in the exhibition design is that I wanted all the wall hangings to be either perpendicular to the entrance of the gallery, or I wanted them to be parallel. And thereby, of, of course, I was mimicking the notion of a, of a warp and a weft. So that was also in my mind. So, that is, so there's one aspect of the exhibition where I wanted this full-bodied encounter with the wall hangings. Visceral, tactile, you, you know, you're really intimately close to these wall hangings. And then the other part of the exhibition was the research wall, notes from my research journey. And um, because this is the first retrospective of Nelly Setna, I decided that I did not want, again, the same cliches or uh, folklore to be repeated about Nelly. And therefore, I intensely researched her work. Now, when you begin to research Nelly's work, what you have is a lot of uncatalogued information, a lot of folklore, hearsay. And I, I decided that it was not just enough to gather the evidentiary material about her life and art. I needed to do two things. The first thing that I did was that I questioned the received narratives about Nelly Setna's life and art. And the second thing that I did was to create new models and frameworks for understanding her work. And that's what this long 20 foot, more than 20 foot long wall actually does. It, it, it plays witness to her practice. It, it raises questions. It is in an argumentative mode. I have the luxury of hindsight as a theorist to look at this material. And I did not want to forego uh, this, this opportunity. I did not want people to again begin with just whatever little fragmentary uh, notions that they had about Nelly Setna. So through, through this particular notes from my research journal, you have an understanding of Nelly's transcultural practice. You have my arguments about uh, Indianness. Uh, you also have uh, some very interesting facets about uh, you know, the, the prehistory of design. So I'll, 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 I'll be taking you through, those, uh, th through, through many of these um, aspects of the research wall. But just uh, one or two more things about the wall hangings themselves before I deep dive into the research wall. So um, it, what, what we have, for example, to the extreme left is this beautiful, elegant wall hanging. And um, the story that was passed on to us was that, uh, that Nelly uh, was very inspired by the towering, towering blocks of NYC. And uh, in the foreground, what you have is the foil cage of Central Park. Now, this is one story, and it's a plausible story because I found out that Nelly went uh, to NYC uh, in 1964 for the, uh, to attend the First World uh, Congress of Craftsmen. Um, 
but what you, what you could also see when you, if you look at, let's say, Kishangar paintings, these are almost like the, the tree forms from Kishangar paintings. So there are many ways in which you can interpret these works. Now I was talking about the yantra and the yoni. We have this beautiful work here uh, in orange and green. And this work, again, works with the notion of optical illusion. And you, of course, have to see it both front and back uh, because it gives you two different perspectives. And in the front, what you have are these Fontana slits or cuts. So again, you can see how textured and sculptural Nelly's wall, ha wall hangings were. And, and, I, and I like the, 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 this kind of you know, dance where all the viewers are walking around these works. This is exactly what you're supposed to do in this exhibition, to, to meander and to walk around these works. It's almost like being in a forest um, around trees. And, and that's something that I, perhaps Nelly would have, would have loved. And, and you can again see the various textures. You know, you almost feel as if some part of the weave feels like moss. Or when you have the rug pile in the extreme left uh, wall hanging, again, it's something very fleecy. So you, you, you have a very tactile feel uh, when, when you look at that particular wall hanging. And you also see within, the, uh, within these wall, uh, wall hangings, you also see um, uh, influences of um, uh, Native American art. For example, this one, the tree of life motif. Um, again, um, you, you have this, uh, this the, uh, either it's, uh, you know, you could think of a peacock or uh, you could think in terms of a mogul flower, um, the peacock's plume or a mogul flower. Uh, and uh, within this exhibition, uh, although uh, most of the tapestries are belong to Nelly Setna, there are two works which um, are by her associate, Roshan Mullah, the, her chief associate who worked with her from 69 to 1992 when she passed away. And uh, those two ta tapestries are uh, on the back wall, the extreme right, uh, which is this figurative pre-Columbian form, and the square within the square work here. And now I'd like to um, uh, ask you to look at this research wall, because what I'll be doing is that I'll be using the research wall as a form of storytelling for you. Um, I remember Radhi Parekh, who had come for the opening, she said, oh, I love these notes because you've personalized them. And I have personalized them because um, these are not just some facts belonging to an artist. These are also... Uh, ideas, debates, arguments that have seized my imagination for 26 years, from the time I was the founder programs coordinator of mock crafts. And of course, then my life took many detours, but somewhere in the end, you come back to where you began. So let's begin at the beginning. We have this gorgeous photograph by Sumi Tarapurwala. And um, it is such a subtle and beautiful framing you have Nelly. Uh, you can already see that uh, this is when she, uh, this is just before her passing away. This was in 84. And she's old and debil debilitated, but she is absolutely super focused, su super focused, super focused despite her illness. And what you see is that she's framed between um, a crucifix and a Rajasthani puppet who is wielding a sword. And you, you find that Rajasthani puppet from her collection on one of these uh, pillars in the exhibition. And I was very, very happy when I found that uh, uh, the puppet, because in, in some senses, then it's, it's a residue or a remnant of Nelly that we have in a very tactile manner. And, and again, uh, if we look at this picture uh, that Sunni has taken, we can read it in different ways. Now, one of the ways I would read it is that on the one hand, you have the crucifix, which is all about stigmata and suffering. And on the other hand, you have this warrior puppet who will wield his sword and mow down anything that comes in the way of uh, the dance of life. And Nelly was a warrior. She uh, really led a heroic life. Um, in 1969, she had the first inklings of uh, suffering from that first inkling that she was suffering from multiple sclerosis. She lost vision in her eye just for a week. Slowly, her body started wasting away. Of course, it, took, uh, it, it wasted away over many years. Uh, but uh, 
she was some she was not somebody who would just um, you know uh, decide to say decide to call quits in fact um, the more she suffered the stronger she became she took every adversity in her stride and fought back and i think that's why she inspires feroza and me as well uh, in fact she inspires all of us as women because she's not somebody who would who would who would give up at any moment and she took everything that was adverse and 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 difficult and turned it into something beautiful so you you have nelly in her old age and then we have a jump cut and we see nelly uh, you know as a young woman maybe in her 20s and uh, nelly was also uh, it's a word that i use uh, as a keyword for the research wall i i call her bebak this is a delicious urdu word which is all about you know being fearless and being fiercely independent and i think that's what nelly was because when you read about how when she was at the jj school of art and she was studying applied arts and um, she felt that the teacher uh, had demoted a friend of hers who was even smarter than her and she fought with him so then the teacher demoted her as well and 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 this is not the end because they they also put up a play where she, in which she performed against this teacher and against this kind of jj pedagogy this kind of colonial art pedagogy which did not allow for any form of questioning and in fact the teacher was there and he said he wanted the he wanted the he he just wanted the play to be closed down but she continued <laughs> to act so this this is the nelly that i want you to remember i mean she wasn't somebody who would be scared of anybody uh, you know she she wouldn't hide behind uh, any adversity or any uh, anything that actually affected her and as i started looking at the material uh, this is the design magazine edited by patwan singh and this is the cover from september 1957 and it has um, uh, it has a, a spread of textile designs by nelly setna this is september 1957 after she realized that she was she's not going to be able to continue with her uh, education at jj she sent her portfolio to the regent street polytechnic it was accepted and she went there and got a to london and got a diploma in in uh, in, in design and uh, and printing in textile design and printing and even the story related to this particular aspect of her pedagogy is very interesting because she she came from a modest background and didn't have the money or the foreign exchange to travel to london and stay there so whatever few shares her mother had they they used those and when she was there she started working she was excellent at embroidery so um, she started working for the queen's queen elizabeth the second's couturier norman norman hartnell she and she started uh, you know burning the candle at both ends she uh, worked as an embroiderer made a lot of money used that not only for a course but also to travel so uh, and and so that was between 54 and 56 and here in 57 you have patwan singh featuring nelly setna's textile designs and as i started looking at uh, this you know the beginning of her practice uh, what you see again is her love for nature stylized insects cacti and so forth now veronica hodge who wrote the article for design magazine in 1957 uh, talks about how she was very happy to have met nelly nelly was a talented um, a textile designer but she had her own uh, anxieties about nelly not being uh, you know indian enough in in her approach she felt that her abstraction was not indian enough she felt that her colors were very muted the that they were like uh, paul clays uh, you know more lighter hues but again i did not just want to take what veronica hodge uh, said uh, at face value so i started looking at the evidence of her design and i realized that actually uh, what veronica hodge was doing is that she was looking at uh, nelly's textile designs through design through this kind of limited parameter of the visual arts actually when you look at the work and you start thinking of you know kind of brodellian approach history in its totality then you realize that what nelly would have been influenced by was the post world war boom in textile design and this was the time in london when you, people were tired of air raids they were tired of rationing and scarcity and the factories which were making 
armaments were now being diverted to the making of domestic goods. So wallpaper glue was available, electric tools were available. And there was a burgeoning middle class which wanted to have a beautiful home, a home which had color and form, which did not just remind them of the depression of the war years. So I think this, and this is where, of course, my education in the humanities, being a student of political science, helps me. Because if you look at it only narrowly through art history, then again, you would be, um, in, in a way, misled. So this, this was, and, and, and uh, then I started pulling out images of Lucien Day, and there was also Jacqueline Groke and Marion Mahler. Now, these were textile designers who were moving away in the 50s and 60s from chintz-inspired floral designs, and they were making these abstract designs. And this is something that Nelly must have been inspired by. So this is just an example to show how I read the material against the green. And, um, and then from there, of course, and she comes back, she already has an invitation from Bombay Dying to head the design studio, an invitation that is given to her by Neville Wadia, who had just started the design studio at Bombay Dying. And then um, a chance meeting in Bombay uh, in the late 50s uh, g uh, helps her uh, to get a scholarship to go to Cranbrook. And um, this scholarship came from, uh, uh, it was in a way uh, facilitated by Mariana Strengel, who was the weaver at Cranbrook Academy of Art. She had come to Bombay to give a lecture, and that's how a meeting happened between her and Nelly. And um, Cranbrook, again, becomes the next step in her pedagogical ladder. Uh, Cranbrook was, um, was, uh, was, was, was a very, very vibrant place where you had um, these interdisciplinary encounters between textile design, art, craft, film. And that would be the environment that, that Nelly would have soaked in. And Nelly was invited to, uh, to do a course in weaving. Now, Nelly goes to Cranbrook, and she does not know anything. She does not even know the basics of weaving. And she, she's, just told, she's, uh, she's taken to the loom and told, OK, now start weaving. So a friend of hers, a Finnish friend, Helena Perintupa, teaches her the basics. And again, being the warrior that she was, she did not just give up. She sat the whole night, she did not go back to her hostel, and she made a work sample at the crack of dawn. And this friend, Helena Perintupa, then becomes somebody that she works with at an ID. So uh, we have Cranbrook, we have um, th this archival image from the Cranbrook uh, Academy of Art is also very interesting because Mariana Strengel um, was already doing work which was um, in a way uh, a step ahead of Loya Saarinen. So the Cranbrook Academy, uh, Eliel Saarinen was the chief architect. He had built much of the Cranbrook campus. He was a legendary architect. His wife was Loya Saarinen, the weaver who had started a commercial studio. And and where, of course, the weavers would, would, would weave to her designs or her husband's designs. And here you have, in the middle, you have uh, Mariana Strengel, and then on, towards the left, you have uh, Loya Saarinen and Loya Saarinen's son, uh, Iro. And this is Eliel Saarinen in, her, in his youth. And what, what, what is really interesting also about the Saarinens is, that uh, Loya Saarinen herself was, was actually, a, uh, she was a photographer and a sculptor. And uh, she, uh, when, when she uh, retired, uh, Mariana Strengel moved the whole weaving program from a more representational style to a more ta tactile and a textured approach. And that is what you also see in Nelly's work. And um, when she comes back from Cranbrook, uh, you see, you, you, you see uh, 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 there's a huge spread in Illustrated Weekly in 1968, where um, you, you see this kind of intense experimentation that Nelly has done. Everything from draperies to textile mobiles, which would be joined at the center and which would be opened on six sides. A huge tapestry for Air India, which was six by nine feet. Um, a, a massive crochet piece that she's making along with her sister, Rhoda Gazdar. So she was also tackling scale, apart from uh, the visceral, tactile feeling of, of a weave. And um, but when I started looking, I mean, she was using the plain weave, double weave, Spanish weave, 
She was using jute and sisal and uh, cotton, unpolished leather. So it was incredible experimentation. And when I started thinking about her Cranbrook legacy, um, again, I did not just want to repeat the fact that, okay, her legacy came from a Nordic um, modernism because her teachers, Mariana Strengel and the Sarinans, Sarinans, Sarinans and others were, uh, were, were Scandinavians. Uh, I wanted to push this further and understand what was this Nordic legacy of modernism that uh, Nelly was an inheritor of. And that's when I started uh, uh, reading all about uh, what, how, the role of crafts in Scandinavian society. And that's where I came upon this notion of sloid. And sloid is a handicraft-based system which, uh, which, was, which, which, which was formulated by Uto, uh, Uto Signes in Finland in the lat latter part of the 19th century. And it involved everything from textile design to, uh, to also woodwork, metalwork, and so forth. And this, this was a state, uh, it was a state pedagogical, a state-run pedagogical program, which means that, uh, you know, the children were initiated from a young age into respecting the crafts and also making self-made products, experimenting with various designs and approaches. And therefore, my argument would be that it is not just merely a legacy of Nordic modernism. I'm, I, I would say it's a Sloyd-inspired modernism. Now, in the, within this, I'm also creating an art historical argument or a debate uh, against a kind of generic understanding of, you know, I mean, European modernism or Western modernism. Because what Mariana Strengel did when she invited her students, uh, you know, to a weaving class was that because she had come from Finland and she was uh, very much, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, overwhelmed by this modernist dogma in art, of art and of uh, crafts, she decided that her students should have a complete clean break with the past, that they should not be inspired by any historical traditions of weaving, that at the beginning they should not even see any other traditions, that they should merely experiment. And again, we need to separate Mariana Strengel's rhetoricity from what she actually did. And that is something that I do constantly through this research wall as well. Because uh, what Mariana Strengel was doing was that she was, in a way, imparting this Sloyd-inspired Nordic modernism to her students, which is fierce experimentation, making self-made products, uh, uh, problem-solving being a kind of key approach within, uh, within these craft traditions. And um, alongside that, uh, while I was also uh, doing more research, I realized that um, we always talk about NID being the birth of modern design in post-independent India. But through my research, I realized that in Sri Niketan, Sri Niketan was the rural construction program of Shanti Niketan. Uh, and in, 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 in Sri Niketan, they had, uh, they had uh, started uh, this, um, uh, they had started a program where they would help uh, craftspeople to become self-sufficient. And then Rathindranath Tagore, Rabindranath's son, at Shilpa Bhavan, uh, they invited uh, craftspeople from uh, who, who, were, who, were, who were trained in, in the Sloyd system. So these Swedish trainers in Sloyd came to Sriniketan to teach the craftspeople. So again, as you can see, there are all these prehistories which are really very, very interesting. And the point I'm making uh, while, you know, in a way going into these dense annotations is also to show you how Nelly was always a transcultural figure. And uh, what she had to deal with uh, was the pressure of this nationalist rhetoricity. So a lot of artists and also the citizens of our country in post-independent India had to navigate around questions of Indianness. So on the one hand, Nelly was a true inheritor of this Sloyd-inspired modernism. On the other hand, she was also an inheritor of Kamla Devi and Pupul, um, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay and Pupul Jaikar's understanding of arts and crafts being a continuum and not being a binary. And even there, I would say that actually, why, why do I say that she's a transcultural figure? Because Sloyd-based Nordic modernism is not too far away from what Kamla Devi and Pupul Jaikar were espousing, which is to not see the arts and crafts as a binary. So they are not misaligned. In fact, they are very much joined. 
and I would use from carpentry a term like joinery. There's a kind of joinery between the sloid based Nordic modernism and the Kamla Devi Jaikar uh, inheritance of arts and crafts being seen side by side. Um, there's Helena Parentupa, who then, uh, on, the on, her rec on Nelly's recommendation, she comes to NID, and then um, Nelly, uh, the, you know, uh, she, she, Nelly and Helena Parentupa lay down the foundations of the textile design course at NID. Uh, there are many other details, but I won't go too deeply into that. The, the, one, of the, one of the things that I would like to emphasize in terms of new models or approaches to this old material is that how artists had to deal with the phantom of Indianness, which was, uh, in a way, uh, imposed upon them. So even Homi Setna talks about how, in one of these oral history interviews, he says, oh, when Nelly went to NID, then, you know, the Indian colors and Indian weaves and forms came into her work. But I would actually suggest that, again, you have to, again, see where does Homi come from. He was a filmmaker aligned with FD, the Films Division. So again, he comes from this top-down Nehruvian understanding of development and of Indianness. So uh, when you actually start looking at Nelly's work, for instance, you have this beautiful uh, you know, double weave carpet. This is from 1968. But in an oral history interview with Mariana Strengel, Mariana talks about how in class, uh, this was in the late 50s, uh, Nelly had actually worked on a brilliant double weave in black and white. Uh, and how it was so intricate and beautiful, and how it's so difficult to work in that and be successful at it. So again, what you're seeing is that there is an outward movement where an artist uh, has to deal with the pressures of ideology, the phantom of nationalism, the phantom of a nationalist, um, you know, a, a kind of a nationalist uh, discourse of art history. And then there is the inward movement, the inner logic of the artwork. So when she's working with black and white, what she's also then dealing with is this notion of push and pull, you know, in this very Joseph Alberis sense of, uh, of, of color theory. How, how, do you, how does an artist deal with outward pressures and the inner logic, which is the evolution of her own practice? And I think that Nelly navigated this astutely, because we've just done an exhibition on Nelly Gobai at Kemold, where he uh, begins with a burst of color and then renounces color. In Nelly's case, she begins with black and white, and then she comes into her own and she, she's looking at this brilliant, vibrant palette of, of Indian colors. So um, it's, it's, of course, two different moves, but it, it's again, you know, wh why do you renounce color? It's not just because it is ideologically related. It's also related at the level of technique. It's, it's about creating, you know, I mean, about not being seduced by color. So I'm also just, you know, I mean, make, making these points in relation to art history, aesthetics, which would also help viewers to, to see uh, both the life of an artist and her art practice in, from a wider perspective. And um, I, I only have now two more things to just share with you, which is that she also did commissions uh, for uh, the Ford Foundation, for the Express Stars. We have this beautiful uh, detail of the Express Stars. A lot of people, a lot of people uh, go to the Express Stars lobby, they walk around it, and they don't even realize that the ceramic murals have been made by Nelly Setna. And she made them at the invitation of uh, Joseph Allenstein, who made the first uh, skyscraper this, uh, in Bombay. And this was on reclaimed land in Dariman Point. So on the one hand, when you look at this, it looks like a weave, although it's a ceramic mural of, made of glazed tiles. On the other hand, you also think about waves. You're, you, when, you, when you are in this beautiful, immersive lobby, you feel as if the ocean is swirling around you. But at the same time, you're also thinking of reclaimed land, which would then become Mariman Point. So you can see also what, I mean, how perhaps, I mean, these are my readings, but you can see how the artist was, in a way, uh, you know, engaging with this particular corporate commission. You have this beautiful tapestry installation um, at the Godrich Bhavan, which I have always noticed whenever I meet uh, Firoza at her office. And now again, this tapestry installation, uh, it has this brilliant cosmic spiral, which is meant uh, to be projected out of the wall. And then it's complemented by concentric quadrilaterals. 
And um, again, the wheel can make you think of industrial progress in a post-independence India. We also have something very, very rare and interesting, which is uh, uh, Joseph Allenstein invited Nelly also to, uh, to make uh, tapestries for the Ford Foundation building, which he had designed. And um, thanks to Ram Rahman, the, the photograph on the left has become quite famous because you have, as Ram says, the balding pate of Joseph Allenstein as he walks uh, through the stairwell. And you have the shoes of Badan Mahata, who's uh, documenting this Ford Foundation building. But in the, in, in the right-hand corner is a tapestry, which in a way has been forgotten. And when I asked Pavan Mata to look through the negative wallet of Madan Mata, he found these tapestries, which definitely to me seem to be like Nelly's tapestries, because they very much are, uh, they follow the organic geometry of Nelly's early work. So these are also different findings from, you know, I mean, different archival findings that in a way enrich uh, the show. And now I'd just like to talk about my last finding, which is what I call the Nelly Setna uh, Collaborative Studio. Uh, Nelly Setna, as, I, as you can see, even in the 60s was working with uh, Rhoda Gusler on this massive crochet piece. Uh, she, uh, so, so this notion of collaboration was not new to her. Of course, as, as she started um, suffering from multiple sclerosis, then um, she started working with her chief associate, Roshan Mullah. And um, Roshan was absolutely dedicated to uh, Nelly, and she never, uh, she, she, she decided to stay with her until her passing away in 1992. Uh, it's, it's also a rare form of sacrifice when I, when I met her, and she's very difficult to meet because she does not answer calls. She's not happy to meet people. So it was a stroke of luck that I just managed. I had a little window, and I could, see, I, I could visit her house and see her. Um, and uh, uh, th this, this, this photograph here is, is actually of Roshan Mullah, uh, as she looks now in 2021. And um, while I was taking the photograph, uh, I realized that in the, in the left-hand corner of the photograph, there is this little figurine. And Roshan was also very talented, like Nelly. And um, in this figurine, you have a, a, a woman wearing a Maharashtrian choli who's holding a little child on her back. And that made me start thinking, uh, uh, you know, that in a way, Roshan had been carrying on her back Nelly Setna, even through her years of uh, debilitation. And it uh, made me start thinking about questions of, was this sacrifice, or can we parse this, this gesture of, uh, Roshan Mullah through in Buddhist terms, in terms of Maitri. And Maitri is not just kindness, which, is, which can also be condescending, but it's loving kindness. It's compassion. So I think, uh, you know, I also wanted to play witness to Roshan Mullah, who was her chief associate. And Roshan Mullah was part of Nelly Setna's studio. But there were also others who you will see in the film with Roshan Kalapesi. Um, there was the cobbler Bhanu, with whom she made leather works. She experimented uh, intensely with leather, as you can see in some of these images. There was also um, Chandrabhaga, the maid who then threaded the beads. Um, there was Man Singh who, who laid out the warp. Uh, and Roshan also did the illustrations in the 70s when Nelly uh, made design interventions in both for Kalamkari and Cruel embroidery in Kashmir. And even here, uh, the, her design intervention in Kalam, Nelly's design intervention in Kalamkari was also very interesting. She did not make new design blocks. She, she actually looked for old design blocks from, uh, you know, go-downs, you know, which had been forgotten, or craftspeople's houses. And then she tweaked those designs, and, and in a way, you know, so in, in, in a way she sort of confluentially used designs from different blocks and made a new composite. So this was always her approach. It was, it was never to impose herself in any way. It was always a way to, to, a way to go around something and to do it in a delicate, subtle manner. So, 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 so the Nelly Setna studio is also something that I wanted to uh, emphasize on this research wall, because Nelly, uh, even in her exhibition invites, always mentions her associates. She was not, uh, unlike contemporary artists, I'm sorry to say, who will get uh, you know, artisans to do work for them uh, or, and just you know, order things on the phone. Um, 
Nelly happily uh, acknowledged all her associates, which is very rare because she was doing this in the 60, in 68 article in Illustrated Weekly. She was doing this for in the two shows that she had in the 80s, um, and 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 of course she always mentioned Roshan's contribution, and she was very very um, thankful to Roshan for having been there for her. And the in the end, this this photograph of Roshan's. Uh, is also here on this wall, not because I've taken it, but because I wanted to, in a way, share with the viewer that research is not just art historical calisthenics. Of course it is. I mean, I'm, I am a very argumentative, per argumentative person, and I will be arguing with art history, but I'm also doing more. Uh, this is also research as an expression of affect. And I think that that's something that's very, very important, because uh, at the end of the day, after we've had all our debates, what we are left with is just something that is very um, deep, moist, like tears, like love. And I think that's what I wanted, that's the note that I wanted to end, end with. Thank you. Nancy, Nancy, thank you, thank you so much for this inspiring lecture, which has given us such an insight into an artist, many of whom, uh, many of us are simply not aware of. And what you've done for Nelly, I think, is an extraordinary piece of uh, art, art history, which is going to be seen in years to come as a most important moment. And I think from the perspective of the gallery, uh, from the perspective of Dr. Godredge, we're all extremely grateful for what you've been able to do in this exhibition. And we look forward to hopefully a lot more information about Nelly coming out through, through your uh, further research in perhaps exhibitions, perhaps publications in whatever format they come. I think all of us uh, owe you a, a, a deep uh, a note, note of uh, gratitude. So thank you so much, Nancy. And thank, thank you to you everyone. So for coming this evening. It is Art Night Thursday, of course, and so there are other exhibitions ongoing in the city. Uh, please do enjoy those exhibitions. There are other uh, walkthroughs, I believe. So uh, with that. We're going to Javeri and Contemporary next, um, and you can follow Carpe Arte on Instagram to follow the schedule of the walkthrough. But yeah. Thank you, Carpe Arte, for being there for us. Thank you.